due process, winner of 21 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights and the 2012 Mid-Atlantic Emmys for outstanding interview special and outstanding discussion series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. I grabbed that joint and I didn't know how to smoke it because I'd never smoked it before. And I lit it and I pulled and in less than 10 minutes, I was able to get off the bed without pain. So Irvina Booker's among the thousands of critically ill patients waiting anxiously for implementation of a bill passed nearly three years ago. A bill to allow at least limited legal access to pot as medicine. With the first distribution center set to open, New Jersey joined 17 other states who said yes, though with the toughest, most restrictive rules yet. Medical marijuana, it's lighting up this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. John Corzine signed it into law on his last day in office. But marijuana as medicine? Only now, nearly three years later, are the first New Jersey patients about to get legal access, joining 17 other states, but with greater limitations than any of the rest. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. And with Alternative Treatment Center number one about to open in Montclair, a decades-long fight nears a major milestone. Some actual legal distribution of the drug just weeks after the death of the woman who fought hardest. Her plea may have been the magic bullet, the single moment after years of failed attempts when one terminally ill woman near the end of her life said, we're not looking to get high, just help us ease our pain. That has taken my life away and my independence. We had visited her just a few months before, as her husband held the pipe so she could smoke marijuana in an illegal attempt to make the agony of ALS a little easier. To allow her to lead a statewide fight and win. But implementation of the Compassionate Use of Medical Marijuana Act has dragged on for nearly three years. We did the regulatory scheme not as a way to kill the program, but as a way to implement the program. The first of six centers where the critically ill under strict state regs will be able to legally pick up pot is finally about to open. But too late for Diane Ripertella, who died just weeks ago. This is what she fought for. And she would have been there. Balloons, you know, Diane would have had a tremendous fanfare. You know, um, she'd be very proud, very, very proud. Proud and relieved to know that her husband would no longer have to break the law every time he bought pot for her and every time he helped her smoke it. And therein lies the problem. You know, now I'm illegal. You know, I, I'm going to get arrested. Um, you know, what if that ever did happen? How, how am I going to take care of her? You know, that's not an option. And Diane was one of thousands who insist that marijuana can work where nothing else can. For all that medication that I have, the only thing that works instantly for me is the 
marijuana. My suffering had come to a point that I just really was going out of my mind. Marta Portuguese too, found that even a drugstore full of opiates wouldn't stop her pain from extreme muscular spasticity. Then she tried a pipeful of pot. And lo and behold, <laughs> within 10 minutes, it was just, I was sitting down. I had crossed my legs like I did now. And I was able to hold a conversation with my husband and I hadn't been able to do that in years. So Marta is among those able to register for the state program, whose disease fits the narrow criteria in the law, anxiously waiting for this center to open. You know, nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to be in pain. But not everyone who suffers, who says marijuana is their best relief, will get through these doors, as Jack O'Brien and his wife know all too well. He was born with deformed hands and feet, describes excruciating pain in his limbs, an agony lessened with the help of marijuana. But O'Brien's ailment isn't in the legislation. So if he needs to keep smoking, it will need to be outside the law. Unfortunately, because chronic pain was taken out of the bill when it was passed, he is not eligible. He is certainly someone that a doctor would recommend medical marijuana for, but the doctor can at this point simply because the law doesn't recognize his condition. Not his neuropathy nor any other chronic pain, unless it's connected to a short list of diseases, like ALS, muscular dystrophy, terminal cancer, and multiple sclerosis, the source of Irvina Booker's two decades of distress. If I can't move and if I'm in a lot of pain, I have to smoke marijuana in order to get up and walk to the bathroom, and it's that hard. So for Irvina, who can't tolerate narcotics, medical marijuana makes the difference between a relatively normal life and a life of real misery. It's made all the difference. You know, I, I don't abuse it. And because her friends understand her need, they take the risk of getting it for her, a risk she thought would end with the legalization of medical marijuana. I was ecstatic because I've been working on this for five years with Drug Policy Alliance. But some grim realities have begun to set in. The need for doctors to register to prescribe marijuana has some patients like Irvina forced to look for new docs. But before writing a prescription, the doctor's required to establish a relationship with the new patient, and that can be expensive. I've called over 15 doctors. Some will take me, but they want $300. Some want two with consecutive visits that I can't afford to do. And the low-income patients can get a break on registration yes. with yes. the state. Anything. There will be no sliding scale on the cost of the drug, which could run to $300 an ounce for product restricted to just 10% THC. I think it's really important to celebrate that milestone and acknowledge that progress. At the same time, we also have to acknowledge that there are still obstacles. Obstacles and the tightest rules in the country. Few allowed ailments, limited distribution of limited weight, a cumbersome registration and no homegrown. So activists say that the fight is not over. You know, we're going to go back and we're going to try and make um, the bill and the regulations even better. This should be an issue between a doctor and a patient, and if a doctor recommends medical marijuana, people should have safe and legal access to it. Still, the opening of this center was what this woman dreamed of, right up till the end. Nobody's going to stop me from doing what I need to do to have my, a normal life. And because of her, mostly because of her, this is, this is going to come about now. And she would be ecstatic. Thank you. Diane won't be easily forgotten, not by the movement she inspired, the legislators she moved, or the thousands of critically ill patients who may finally have legal access to what they say is the unique relief 
of marijuana. But there are still some who say that the law is flawed, and others who insist that allowing any legal marijuana is a major mistake, as we'll hear from Terrence Farley, the former first assistant prosecutor in Ocean County, from State Senator Nick Scutari, the primary Senate sponsor of the medical marijuana bill, and from Dr. Jeffrey Miskoff, a pulmonary critical care specialist who favors the law but sees big problems with the implementation. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Doc, let me start with you. You're a medical doctor, but you've followed this discussion and the evolution. Uh, big restrictions like limited numbers of ailments for which medical marijuana can be used, uh, limitations of about 10% on THC, the active ingredient, mm -hmm. and a strange kind of process of training for doctors. Are these limitations, the ones that are being talked about, basically policy and political limitations, or are they a result of medical and scientific analysis? I think more political. Um, I think the, the medical illnesses that they listed are reasonable, and I think that's a broad enough list, at least to start. Um, as far as the 10% cap goes, as physicians who treat critically ill patients, dying patients, hospice patients, um, we use medications and narcotics that are way more powerful than this. There's no cap. So nobody tells me that I have to stop treating somebody at two milligrams of morphine drip, or four milligrams for that matter. So putting a cap of 10% on puts a hindrance on us to be able to effectively and clinically treat the patient. Let me ask you one question. Would having a broader category of giving physicians the opportunity to prescribe for chronic pain invite abuse, or is that a system that could work medically and from a policy point of view? I think in any field we have unethical people working, physicians, uh, there's unethical patients as well. So sure, it could invite abuse, but there's also the uh, exception, or I should say, uh, chronic muscle spasticity, which could be almost construed as chronic pain. So I believe that that's an exception or loophole that um, will allow some patients who may not really require it uh, to be able to attain the medication. Well, we see Jack O'Brien, who does seem to be in terrible pain, being closed out of the program. You know, the, the deformed hands and feet, yes. not considered to be enough evidence of um, a critically ill person right. so that he's shut out. You still would say that the, the list is long enough? No, I think for cases like that, they can be individualized. And there is room for the physician to, or the patient and the physician, to request that the medication still be prescribed or recommended. But it has to go through an annual process, and it can be denied. So, so patients like that may or may not have chronic spasticity. They may just have chronic pain. So, Nick, what would you say is the, the chance that you're going to get patients like that who will get to go through the exception process successfully? Well, well the first thing I want to say is this is a work in progress. Uh, we did have an, a, a reluctant and resistant administration initially because John Corzine was out as the governor. And you had the to make after. a lot of compromises. And we made a lot of compromises, some of which were for medical purposes, some probably were for political purpose, purposes. But I would say that I believe that the administration is full forward now. They are committed to having a medical-based program that the commissioner, Mary O'Dowd, and their director, John O'Brien, who's a... But the director's a former trooper. He's a 26-year veteran of the state police. But doesn't that say that this is more of a police approach than medical? Well, I, I would suggest that... By the that, way, we did invite them both here, and we were not able yeah. to get them. Well, there were political realities to the administration of the program, but I will say that I, I have gotten complete cooperation from the commissioner uh, throughout the last year since the governor actually decided to move forward, and I'll, I'll credit them for at least moving the forward uh, the program forward and attempting to make it on a medical basis because there's not just one cannabinoid they're going to be testing for a number of different things to make sure that this kind of product is available and safe uh, for patients it's not just for recreational use it's not for recreational right, use. right but in so. giving in again and again on things like homegrown which is one of the big complaints that you hear sure. from people involved in this in this movement that we are not allowed to have homegrown. We're not selling edible marijuana. All right. of those restrictions. Did you give away too much? Well, I don't think so. I'll tell you this. I introduced the bill a year after I was a state senator. People looked at me like I had two heads. What are you, out of your mind? You're going to have a short career in politics. But I believed in the program. I believed in the medical-based program. I mean, you know, George Washington grew marijuana in his backyard. Somehow this marijuana has become just the devil. Uh, and when we believe and we think and doctors believe and patients believe that, it can help in these very serious conditions. So um, there's always compromise, but I believe it's a work in progress. I believe that oh, when we do get the program off the ground, which it's on the precipice of doing now, that we're going to see it uh, become one of the best programs in the country. Terrence, let me ask you some things about the law enforcement perspective. You have a reputation as a pretty hard-nosed prosecutor, although I like to think you wouldn't have prosecuted George Washington, but probably the jury's still out on that. But if you take a, a tragic case like Diane Ripportella with ALS, 
do you think it's appropriate for her condition if the only relief she gets is from marijuana, that that's the kind of person who should get medical Absolutely, marijuana? and I've said it a hundred times on TV and speeches that there are a certain class of people who, if they are being helped with their pain, I have no problem. I don't, but I want them to have a condition that's going to kill them. But we've heard both the senator and the doc say that there is a mixed bag here of some decisions that are medically driven and some are policy driven. Correct. Why shouldn't all the decisions relating to the use of this substance be driven by medical necessity? If it provides significant relief to a person in significant pain or in a terminal case, why not provide it? Because we have unscrupulous doctors all over the country making millions of dollars giving out recommendations for marijuana. There's one guy in Los Angeles whose only job is to fly to his office in Seattle and his office in Honolulu once a week and sign but his Jersey's name. But New Jersey's not California. It's not only not. is our statute different, but our culture is different, the levels of enforcement. It's a smaller state. Why would we have to be bound by the experience of a state that some people say is well, a Well, then take Colorado, take Arizona, take any of the states where it's been approved it's not just California, Oregon. It took years and years to get this approved in Oregon. And the uh, Oregon Medical Society told the legislature there in order to get it passed, there'd be maybe 500 people getting cards. In the first year, they had over 10,000. The 10,000, over 60% were written by three doctors, some of whom who never saw their patients. But this is a That's really tight why. program in New Jersey. You're not satisfied you, that it's tight enough? It? Well, for one thing, it? you see, you've got the doctors registered. You see how many prescriptions are being written by a handful right. of doctors as opposed to um, a neurologist, a critical care specialist who is prescribing for a few patients of theirs. And is that going to stop these people? There's I don't nothing know. You say no. The, well, there's nothing in uh, no enforcement situation in the statute saying a doctor can only write 50 prescriptions a year, he could write 10,000 a year. So Nick, why aren't we worried about this? Well, our, our statute is written as tight as it could possibly be. I, I believe in the merits of the program. I believe in the administration's commitment to making it a medical-based program. And we're not talking about the, I mean, uh, marijuana has been so demonized as if it's, uh, why, why is there this tremendous thirst in these other states? Uh, I can't get to that, but I can tell you that in the state of New Jersey, the medical marijuana program is tight. Uh, I think we, it's, it's taken three years to get off the ground, uh, and I, I believe it's, it's not ripe for abuse. In fact, I think it's, we've only got 264 patients that have either registered or a pending registration after three years of the program and 173 physicians have signed up for it. So you're not going to see that. I mean, you're going to see medical marijuana utilized under this program for medical purposes. You know what I hate most about it? Calling it medical marijuana. There is no such thing as medical marijuana. This is marijuana. The end. What would you call it? I mean, if we have Marijuana. Started. Just like it is. And what what is do you call Percodan? Medical Percodan? Or medical fentanyl? Well, there's illegal marijuana, and then there's medical marijuana. And and this is not. We could call we could call it legal percodan, I guess. <laughs> right. And, you know. But the fact of the matter is, what makes this marijuana any different than anything else? The answer a ten, is a ten percent cap. <laughs> okay. But what's it's the weaker. harm that you see? Because obviously you, did, you said that for a purpose. What's the harm you see in As calling for, it medical marijuana, saying that it's marijuana? Because medicine. that's how they got people to uh, change their minds and approve this program. Every one of the major proponents of marijuana usage in this country, the uh, Normal, uh, the Criminal Justice Foundation, the Drug Policy Alliance, which is the big one in New Jersey, um, all of these groups have told you for years this is a red herring. There is no such thing as medical marijuana. It's a red herring to get marijuana usage passed. Actually, I, I, think, well, they, they, I think what they've said is we want marijuana passed across the board. Yeah, right. We want it to criminalize, legalized across the board. But medical marijuana is a distinct and separate thing, and we also well, favor that. That's not what they said. You think that's said. not legit? That's, well, I'm telling you, it's not what they said. If you look at Keith Stroop's comments about the red herring or Kevin Zeese, they just say it's a step towards decriminalization. And I guarantee you, 
that is the next step. But well, you know, the one thing I'll say is that the people, see, the, the people of the state of New Jersey are the ones who decide, and, and the people in the legislature are elected to represent them. And we've, re we've decided that people that are dying or are sick, they should be allowed to make a decision with their doctors that their pain will be relieved by marijuana. If that's Terry, an says only, why, Terry says only if they're dying. Is that, that would be even that. more dis restrictive than what we have. That's well, not what we've decided. Yeah, and the hope, the hope, the hope is, is that an HIV patient, let's say, that has nausea, vomiting, chronic pain, isn't going to die. That we have medicines that can keep them alive for 25 years. You're right. So we don't, we don't want to have a disease that they're going to die. As physicians, we, doc, we want to save them. Look at the states that have it. 2% of the people in California have AIDS, glaucoma, cancer, uh, HIV, same thing in Oregon, same thing in Hawaii, same thing in Montana. It's not being used by those people. A tiny percentage of those people are using it. And as I said, if somebody's got a condition that's going to kill them, first of all, this doesn't but cure is, anything. Is it your view that the members of the state legislature who voted in favor of this are being duped into some downward sliding Absolute, domino situation uh, from which we can't recover? And the fact of the matter is, those people are deciding what should be medicine. Should I have Nick Scateri tell me that he, he uh, had a little chemical formula in his garage and you can use it because the legislature says it's well, okay. Tell, first, I, thought I was going to ask you, you're in the legislature. You know, we, is we, that who you I are? Thought, that's yeah. I didn't know you were so pliable. Uh, I first of all, marijuana has medical. been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. No one's ever thousands, died, thousands. Thousands. And, and no one's ever died from it. I mean, we have the most potent chemical substances available at our doctor's discretion in order to, to, to kill pain and to kill people if they overprescribed it. But marijuana has never done that in the history of this world. And what the senator is making in his garage, or not making in his garage, I should say, is, is not regulated. There's no data on it. There is some data. There is anecdotes on medical marijuana being well, successful in certain conditions. Well, and I'll say We're this. Not, the, the, the department it helps pain, and I agree with that. Well, I'll tell you this, but the Department of Health is... Well, hold on, hold on. There's 20% reduction in intraocular pressures with glaucoma. And, well, That's then why is it that the American <clears throat> Glaucoma Association said don't use it under any circumstances? Well, there's other medications that are FDA approved that should ah, be used first. Ah, they're FDA approved. And this isn't and is never going to be. Well, there's the difference, Doc. You've been answered the question. Left. But, the, but, the, gov here, but the government has, right. has the feds who have the whole FDA process have essentially come to a de facto understanding that they're not going to prosecute caregivers or a carefully regulated system like I can Jersey. tell you this, that Governor Christie would not move forward with this program if he didn't believe that it was going to meet federal uh, snuffness test, the sniff test, and we were going to be coming in here and be prosecuted by federal prosecutors, of which one he was for a long period of time. I give his administration <coughs> credit for moving forward with the program. Uh, they've got it medically based. They've really got some tremendous testing procedures where they're going to test not just the THC levels, but all the different canals that are in the product in order to try to match those with the conditions that the doctors prescribe it for. And that is a difference between medical marijuana and illegal marijuana is that this should be hopefully cleaner, more regulated, and grown stuff. And who's going to determine it? And how are we going to determine the it? Department it? Department of Health. Should, Department of Health is so the state should test everybody who grows marijuana to determine what the THC content is, how many cannabinoids? It would cost billions that, of dollars. That's absolutely that's, true. That's, that's exactly what we're doing in the program now. Well, if you are, it's going to cost billions of dollars. Sure that's the same way you that get it's working so well. that you get any uh, medicine approved. You go through an FDA process. They're eliminating that. Or, as the senator's now saying, the state's going to do it. The state can't do it. They're not equipped. And if they were equipped, it would cost a fortune. That's the biggest bitch by uh, drug companies in New Jersey, which we're full of, that it takes too long and costs too much money to approve a legitimate drug. Did the legislature look at the cost-benefit analysis in the context of this legislation? This is a self-funded program. I mean, this, is, this is going to be paid for by the patient registration and by the product and the, and the registered uh, program users, the six facilities that are there. And, and they have a great testing procedure already in place. From what I understand, they're ready to go once the uh, certificate of occupancy is granted to the monitor That means facility. the senator believes the $150 fee is going to be used to uh, analyze this stuff when you're talking about maybe $150 million if it was a real drug. Terry, I'm going to have to stop you there with okay. much more to say. Uh, we are out of time with our thanks to Terry Farley, Jeff Miskoff, and Nick Scutari. But before we go, some good news for due process. At Mid-Atlantic Ceremonies of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, we walked away with two new Emmys. 
for both Outstanding Talk Series and Outstanding Talk Special. And that brings... Thank you. And that brings the total number of due process regional Emmys to an unprecedented 21. So you want to join us next week and every week for more of what we do best, in-depth coverage of important issues of law and justice and public policy. For Sandy, associate producer Tanya Ivanova, and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. know how to smoke it because I'd never smoked it before and I lit it and I pulled and in less than 10 minutes I was able to get off the bed without pain. I had called my daughter crying because I couldn't move and she worked at a distance in Parsippany so she had to drive to come down Route 80 to help me out. By the time she left her job and reached me, I was moving again. She walked in the house, she smelled the marijuana, Mommy, you okay? You okay? And I said, yes, I'm able to move. I smoked marijuana, and she had no idea that I had this in the house. And that was it. That was the beginning for me. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.